Uh, I think I'm quite comfortable at this. Okay, so a very good morning uh, to all of you uh, for attending our uh, symposium today. So what I'll be focusing on will be on disciplinary literacy, uh, specifically in the area of science. Okay. Uh, because of the limitation of time, it, the talk has to be quite condensed and perhaps at the level that is quite superficial. But if you are interested in disciplinary literacy, I'll be very happy to uh, talk to you, with you a little bit more and hopefully we'll learn from each other. <clears throat> so literacy, uh, disciplinary literacy is quite a relatively new uh, notion um, that has um, emerged over the past decades or so. Uh, and it's mainly used among um, literacy educators, which uh, and it emphasizes the unique tools, especially semiotic tools, by display experts to participate in the work of the discipline. And um, the aim of this movement is at least twofold. One is to identify all reading and writing relevant distinctions among the disciplines, and secondly, to find ways of teaching students so as to negotiate successfully these literacy aspects of the disciplines. And hopefully the insight drawn from this would help students, uh, teachers better understand the practices of their disciplines. Okay. Now disciplinary literacy, in, in a way, um, uh, one of the reasons for the emergence of the disciplinary literacy is the increasing recognition that generic strategies for teaching, um, reading and writing um, is no longer, uh, is, uh, which are emphasized in content area literacies, are not sufficient to achieve proficiencies among um, students in the different disciplines. Okay? And especially to bring about further improvement in the um, performance of average and above average students. So alongside these recognitions is this ever-expanding body of research um, that illustrates the unique features and conventions of how language is used in different disciplines. Um, this research, especially those uh, which has its root in functional grammar, um, has illustrated that uh, language in different disciplines um, has very distinctive purpose, uh, specialized genre, symbolic artifacts, and it has its own conventions as well as standards of quality and precision. Okay. With respect to science, um, the distinctive features of scientific language, of course, is one, one feature is its high technicality, which is represented by its huge body of specialized vocabulary and also the attributions of new meaning to everyday words, like false. Okay? Uh, it also, the, there is also a unique use of grammar in science itself, for example, by its preference for passive voice, and its uh, preference for use of uh, nominalizations, where process verbs like uh, expand and contract are converted into noun, like uh, expansions and contractions. Um, and by virtue of... Uh, uh, normalization, you can actually uh, construct very lengthy and abstract nominal groups such as the increasing rate of thermal expansion. Now, if you don't, uh, if, if there's no nominalizations, you probably will have to take a few clauses in order to describe how uh, the expand, uh, when an object expands, how it rate changes and the kind of expand, how the kind of expansion that took place. But with the nominalizations, you can actually uh, condense everything into a single nominal group, such as the increasing rate of thermal expansions. So normalization does serve a particular functions in scientific uh, writings. Uh, at the same time, students also encounter many different types of texts, such as uh, practical reports, descriptive accounts, and course explanations. So we can see that um, the, the distinctive uh, features of scientific language can uh, present a lot of demands on science students as they learn science itself. Now, so what does this imply for learning? Actually, way back in the early 90s, um, Halliday has already talked about the role of language uh, learning in all subject classrooms. Um, in his language-based theory of uh, learning, he talked about how uh, an, uh, in all classrooms, students engage in three modes of learning. Learning, about, uh, learning through language, as we all know, as well as learning of language, learning how to talk and um, write and um, read the different uh, language used in the classrooms, as well as learning about language itself, meaning to treat language as a system that is worthy of examinations and study. Okay? Now, uh, with the advancement of disciplinary literacy, we can see that what this actually means in the subject classroom itself, that in order to um, um, 
learn about uh, the subject matters. It involves a lot about not just the subject ideas itself, but it involves learning and uh, to write and read science, learning how to talk and listen to science, and also learning how to scrutinize the language that is being used in science itself. Now, uh, in uh, the literacy educated uh, research may not have put much emphasis on um, representations that is beyond natural language. But uh, there's been a huge body of research on multi-modality and multiple rep representations and that highlights that in fact scientific language actually involves a lot of other representations besides language. So, uh, besides natural language such as graphs and diagrams and um, other mode of representations. So, I did include uh, representing agreeing science as, as a another dimension of disagreeing literacy. Now, interestingly, the fo increasing focus on discipline literacy in the literacy uh, world has, uh, view has also dovetailed with the uh, recognitions of scientific practices in science itself as represented by this diagram. Now, in US, the three-dimensional learning framework for K-12 science education um, has, uh, which is used to generate, uh, develop the uh, national, uh, the second next generation's core standards. In this framework, the scientific practices actually ranks in importance as the uh, core ideas, scientific core ideas, as well as cross-cutting uh, ideas. So according to this framework, which describes a vision of what it means to be proficient in science, scientific practices actually describe behavior that scientists engage in as they investigate and new models and theory about the natural world. Okay. Now this is the list of the scientific practices that is uh, uh, found in this framework itself. And you can see that I highlighted those uh, list of practices that um, are more directly related to disciplinary literacy, such as asking questions, constructing explanations, or engaging in arguments and communicating information. But of, uh, obviously, the other uh, practices also in some way or other, directly or indirectly, also does actually involve students' ability to uh, read and write. Okay. Now, I could discern actually two possible relations between discipline literacy and scientific practices, depending on how um, discipline literacy is uh, being scoped. For example, if we think of discipline literacy as confined to uh, literacy practices, we can see that it's actually a subset of scientific practices with um, the uh, uh, part on scientific practice process skills related to the conductive investigation falling out of uh, discipline literacy. However, if we think of discipline literacy as applicable, as something that we expect students to uh, learn in all subject matters, then we see that these um, scientific practices as a subset of discipline literacy, where the students have to learn not just um, practices unique to science itself, but also across different subject areas. Now, what does this have implication for our classroom practice? Um, I think for, in order to be able for teachers to develop this literacy among our students, it is therefore uh, crucial that um, they are able to design learning tasks and activities that open up opportunities for students such that they can practice and develop uh, various discipline practices. For example, one of the areas would be to uh, be able to extract information from multiple texts in the context of scientific inquiry and synthesize them um, together. At the same time, be able to generate a wide range of scientific genre that mirrors the work of scientists. Okay? At the same time, is there, uh, as you conduct the different activities, it's important to also adopt strategies that enable students to learn not just through language, but also to use language and uh, learn about language itself. So students' uh, scaffolding of the use of language in science will be an important part, as well as making explicit the form and function of language use in science. Uh, as part of the as, uh, assessment, it is also therefore important to elicit, evaluate, and diagnose students' use of language. Okay. Now, so what does this uh, um, entail for the teacher's professional development? We can now turn to uh, Suman's uh, uh, pedagogical content knowledge uh, to better understand, uh, to use it as a theoretical lens 
to understand the kind of knowledge that student, uh, teachers would need in order to uh, develop discipline literacy. Now, there are many different components uh, of uh, PCK as advocated by different um, PCK researchers. But for the, this purpose of these presentations, I will focus on just three of them, subject matter knowledge, knowledge of instructional strategies, and knowledge of students. So what would be the different uh, constituents of the three different knowledge that teachers would need in order to uh, better facilitate the uh, teaching of discipline literacy? Now for subject matter knowledge, uh, it will be quite crucial therefore for teachers to be able to know what are the role of language that uh, what's the role that language play in science, the distinctive features of scientific language, as well as the different literacy skills that um, uh, for reading and writing science, as well as the form function relationships of language. Um, and how to use this uh, knowledge to uh, translate it uh, in a way that students will be able to uh, understand them would require strategies for teaching students about these different aspects of the subject matter knowledge, right? Um, and in my own studies, um, I also realized that when teachers um, have a um, sophisticated knowledge about students' use of language, it makes a difference in the way they make use of the different strategies and activities uh, when it comes to uh, when they um, execute those activities in the classroom itself. For example, I could identify four components among the teacher's knowledge in my own study that actually play a role in the way they shape their instructional approaches. For example, the teacher's knowledge of their students' prior knowledge of and about language, the kind of difficulty they face in scientific language, as well as how they perform differently across different literacy, such as reading and writing science, as well as how they perform differently across different subject areas. And this, especially in the primary uh, teachers, where they teach, uh, they have to teach uh, English language and science, that's where they are most able to see the difference in their ability in when they teach different subjects. Okay. Now, the implications, what does this mean for professional development? I guess um, currently most teachers, uh, the focus of current uh, professional development in teachers is on scientific conceptual knowledge and their everyday conceptions. But moving forward, if we would like to develop more uh, teachers' uh, ped uh, pedagogy or for discipline literacy, then there's a need to focus not just on the conceptual knowledge, but also the distinctive nature of scientific language and literacy practices, as well as the form-function relationship of language. And uh, associated with that is not just students' everyday conceptions, but what is the common misrepresentation. That means what are the uh, common way of uh, common um, language error that is made by students that um, result in them misrepresenting their own uh, knowledge of science, as well as a way to elicit, elicit, evaluate, and diagnose them. So I would like to build on what um, uh, Ban Ping was talking about, that it's important for you de to design tasks to uh, elicit students' idea and to di um, be able to assess them. But I think... Um, we have to be careful that not whatever students represent uh, in paper or in other forms may not truly represent their thinking because that also depends on their ability to use the different representational tools. So if they are not sophisticated in their use of language, uh, then whatever that they represent may not be uh, what they had intended to represent in the first place. So knowing how they use language is also a very important part of learning what they uh, what. Um, how they uh, represent their own ideas. So with that, I would like to invite uh, Jennifer to discuss about uh, discipline literacy in greater uh, details. Hi everyone, I'm Jennifer from uh, the Natural Sciences and Science Education um, Academic Group. Uh, thank you very much, um, Lei Hun, for inviting me to you know, uh, just build on what she has just presented on disciplinary literacy. Uh, prior to this presentation, we actually had a long meeting and um, you know, for me to try and understand uh, what disciplinary literacy was all about. And I think um, as we were talking about it, uh, a couple of things that came to my mind and that was you know, what students said when I was teaching in school and even uh, anecdotes from colleagues, you know, uh, uh, more of those teaching the natural sciences. And one of the things that a chemistry lecturer my chemistry colleague told me was that one 
first year degree student asked him, is the electron in physics the same as the, phys uh, the electron in chemistry? And when I was teaching, um, students always tell me, you know, uh, man, the physics graph is different from the chemistry graph, and which is different from the math graph. So they have different nationality in that sense. And the same goes with numbers, because in physics, we often ask them to calculate numbers, right? Quantitative, physical quantities, and they said, you know, math is really very difficult to remember. Math says 3DP, physics says least sick pig. Why can't you guys make up your mind? You know, so why is that so? Right? All this has really got to do with representations. It really has got to do with the language in itself. And uh, if we think about what traditional, uh, traditionally, what we understand from science learning is all about. And in fact, I tried to ask, uh, show these three sentences to some of my colleagues, you know, uh, the earlier one. And they said, yeah, electron is electron is electron. You know, and the graph is a graph is a graph. They learn, math, uh, they learn graph in math. They must know how to plot graph in physics. But seriously, I think that might not be really true if we take the lens of what Lehun is taking. Yeah. So traditionally, science learning is just all about conceptual change, right? You got a misconception. I, I, I do something to you, right? I have some learning tasks. I show it to you, and you should be convinced. You know that um, things, all things fall down at the same speed. You see it, you believe it. Yeah. I tell you that you know there is. Um, this is the way to use this word or that word, and that's it. Okay. So that is really from a very much conceptual change perspective. But where Lehun is coming, as I would see it, would be more about participation. You know, understanding not just the concept, the meaning that is being made, but how the meaning is being made. And how then, I could then use the tools of, of, the, of the community in the way I communicate with others to build more meanings, to advance ideas. And that comes from the tradition of looking at it uh, as a participation. Now, and... What Lehun is trying to put forth is therefore that, as I see it, is that, you know, traditionally literacy is just mainly talking about reading and writing. Yeah, and one, ex uh, one, one way of looking at it is that, well, if I just expose you to text, you know, if I get you to um, participate in doing inquiry, you should be able to part, uh, be able to speak signs, read signs, and that's about it. Yeah? You, it's like, you know, you, you are kind of like enculturated into that whole, whole um, practices of science. But what I really like about Lehun's model in disciplinary literacy is really the part about um, scrutinizing scientific language. And I really like that part because really learning science is not just simply because you're in the community, you get it, you, you, you are in it, you know it, and hence you understand it. I think there is a certain extent that students must understand what is the different types of graphs, even with, uh, between physics, chemistry, and in mathematics. And even within physics itself, the different topics, the kind of graphs that we plot, there are nuances in it. Like, for example, if we are talking about, let's say, thermal physics, pardon me if uh, some of you are not physics uh, um, familiar with the, with, the, with the topic of physics. But you know, in thermal physics, sometimes we talk about um, how um, changes take place over uh, maybe over 10 minutes, 20 minutes, all right? This is this, if we are talking about, uh, let's say, dynamics, where we talk about impact, something dropped onto the table. And that split second change results in the kind of force that is exerted on the table. And in that sense, the time difference is so different. So, as, so if we think in terms of the graph, then that would be very different because our scale, the scale that we, we are concerned about has to, be, has, has to have a very high precision as compared to if it is 10 minutes. And if you think about biology, sometimes we track changes over years, months and years. So there is actually a great difference between the different types of graphs, the way we read, the way we draw the way we understand, therefore, what is the purpose of the different types of graphs. In a similar vein, let's talk about just about electrons. Again, the same thing goes. 
In physics, in, in chemistry, they are very concerned it must be electrons, negative ions, maybe Na plus, you know, sodium ion, positive ion. In physics, who cares? Positive charges, negative charges, or just call them all particles. You know, because we are not so concerned about the specificity about whether it is this particular ion or that particular ion, or it is two plus, one plus, two minus, or whatever that might be. Because all we are concerned is about how the charges behave and interact with each other in terms of causing things to, to attract or to repel each other. Yeah, so in that sense, if we think about it, therefore, what does this mean to then learning science in terms of participation, especially if we were to look into this new, new uh, framework, an expanded framework of what literacy is all about? That therefore students, it's not sufficient for students to just simply know how to read and write because they memorize, because teachers say 3DP, because teacher says least SF, because teacher says, you know, you must have, you, uh, per division, you cannot have uh, an odd number. That's what we always tell students, right, for those of us who are physics teachers, okay? What you really need to do, what the students really need to understand is why. And not just because when you ask them why, teachers say so. Okay, and so going back to that, therefore, it, is, it, it, uh, it means that understanding of science becomes understanding the form and its function. And to understand its form and function, it means that the students must understand not, uh, also what, what, what does it mean to that body of knowledge? What does that mean, the epistemological and the ontological? How does it come about? Why is that important? What's the thinking behind it? What's the reasoning that scientists have that led to these different characteristics? Yeah? And, uh, and would that help to overcome this confusion about the different ways in which science represents things differently from mathematics, uh, physicists, physics different from chemistry, different from biology? Perhaps. I'm not sure. Okay, I think we need to look further into it. But in the work that I do, which I take a multimodality lens, I do find that a lot of students, they do not, because, uh, when, okay, in my work, I, I get students to kind of like look into, uh, to explain, okay? And the kind of representations they use actually give an indication that they do not know what's the function. Like they could be using a graph to explain something when, what they need to do when the, uh, when the question um, requires them to produce a causal explanation, which means they have to use the kinetic theory to explain it. Yeah. So, uh, well, so it, it, uh, I would think that um, this disciplinary literacy framework does provide us with some uh, a glimpse of hope, maybe? I don't know, or, or direction in which we could you know, try and see how we could um, help students to learn and understand physics or science better beyond just a conceptual change. Now, so as, as a physics educator, then what does that mean in terms of um, developing teachers if we were to uh, pay more attention to this thing called disciplinary literacy? Especially in the light that uh, uh, in this uh, science syllabus um, uh, review that is currently going on, and there is serious um, consideration by the ministry to um, to look into this particular framework of um, the what do you call that again? The call uh, the the practices of science, right? From the NGSS, um, then we 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 need to also ask ourselves. Therefore, then what kind of knowledge do teachers need in order to, uh, to be able to enact you know, or, or to develop students in that particular direction? I would think that firstly, there is um, a need for epistemological shift. As in many studies that um, look into uh, how, uh, how they could um, engage students in doing modeling, in science, okay? So like this work done by Keitler and uh, his colleagues, 
where he got they got students to uh, construct representations, not just words itself, but all forms of representation. One of the um, one of the challenges that uh, teachers mentioned is that it's a very different way of looking at science. You know, very often we just think of, of it as concepts, but now you, they have to actually think in terms of what is the form and function of this representation, and that's difficult. I've tried to do it with my pre-service teachers. It's really difficult for them to really try and identify how a concept like force can... The idea of force is is represented in so many different forms, and these different forms play a certain function in building this whole idea of force. It's really difficult for them. And I think um, um, then the second implication is that then as even as science educators, we need to also be very clear about um, this concepts, uh, the relation between concepts and representations, if we want to guide our teachers and hence for them to guide the students to really understand and to develop this uh, disciplinary literacy. Yeah, so that's about it I have. Um, yeah, so the other thing is I'd like to ask you, do you think they are the same? <laughs> I've tried asking some of my colleagues and they go like, yes, they are the same. Okay, but anyway, we can discuss this during uh, tea break. Okay, right, thank you.